Hello from the Fortronics YouTube channel and welcome to designing a low noise four channel DAC circuit with the MAX 5134 and this will be part one in a two part series. So in this series I'm going to focus on two things. The first is just how to implement this type of four channel DAC which is 16 bit in your circuit the MAX 5134 and then I'm also going to talk about the supporting cast circuit though around it and how to make sure that's a low noise power sources, communication signals to ensure you're getting the most accuracy and the most useful resolution out of your DAC that you can, or ADC for that matter. Before I get started, I'll just mention, please support Forstronics on Patreon, where you can find exclusive content from my video series, as well as from this video series. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the Forstronics YouTube channel. And if you like what you see here, please hit the thumbs up. All right, let's get started. Okay, in my summary, I'm just talking about a little bit what I mentioned in the beginning of this video was that not only are we going to cover how to implement this MAX 5134 DAC uh, from analog devices into your circuit, but also how do we create a low noise circuit bed that allows us to power and control the DAC that's not going to degrade its accuracy because this DAC chip is not cheap. So what's the point of buying a DAC chip that has all these great specs, high resolution, good accuracy, if the circuit around it's going to ruin that. And when I use the term useful resolution, right, you can have as much resolution as you want in a circuit, in a chip, in an ADC, in a DAC. But if there's noise that's causing errors in your accuracy, then that resolution really isn't that useful. You can't change the fact that this is a 16-bit DAC, but if you have a noisy circuit, you're not going to get useful information from those 16 bits. Okay, in part one, it's all going to be about talking about the components we're using, talking about how to implement them in your circuit. So we're going to do that by going through schematics of this circuit and how to implement it. And then in part two, we're going to talk about PCB layout practices, mainly focusing on ensuring that we're getting the most accuracy out of our DAC chip and then we don't have noise on our circuit. And then we're going to do a demo of the DAC circuit and show some example measurements. I probably won't get into the code in part two just because of time, but all the design files, you know, the bomb and the code from this series will be available on Forstronics Patreon page. Okay, we're looking at my PCB layout software. And the first step when you're doing PCB layout is you create the schematic. So I'm going to use this software to kind of go over how I implemented the circuits. And so this is our DAC IC, and these, these things in red are components, like this is obviously a resistor, and then these green lines create signal paths. So they represent signal paths that are connecting the, the components. And of course, these red lines here are the pins for the chip. And then whenever you see a green line that has a label, that means that wherever you see that label again later on in the schematic, that's where a connection is made. So this DAC1 will connect to the output connector on a different schematic and they'll both have this label DAC1 showing that a connection should be made. All right, I hope that makes sense. Let's start going through how to implement this DAC chip. This is a four channel DAC and the outputs are all labeled DAC1, 2, 3, and 4. And it's controlled using SPI communication. And this is the type of setup where your microcontroller or your master control device only talks to this chip, this chip doesn't respond back. So all you have is the MOSI pin or the data in pin. There is no MISO pin. Here is the chip select pin to tell it when, when we're communicating to it. Here's we have where we have the SPI clock signal, which can go up to 30 megahertz with this DAC. Now this DAC has three different power sources, and it's real important here because noisy power sources are the biggest contributors to DAC and ADC degrading the accuracy of those devices. So let's we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the power sources a little bit on this schematic, but on the next schematic when I go over the power source implementations. So VCC is five volts and it's the analog supply. So it's supposed to be a very low noise supply. We get it from a low noise linear regulator, which I'll show in the next schematic. But that's supposed to be very low noise because it's powering our analog circuitry in our DAC. So we don't want to add any noise to that. This VCC IO is the digital supply. It's five volts. It also comes from the same linear regulator, but there is a little filtering in between these to ensure noise from the digital communication that might get on the power supply doesn't affect the analog circuitry in the DAC. So that's why we have those two divided, right? And this is what the data sheet tells you to do, right? Because we have AVDD, 
and we have DVDD. A stands for analog, D stands for digital. So we're doing exactly what the schematic, or not the schematic, the data sheet for the DAC is telling us to do. The third power source is the reference. So if you're not familiar with DACs or ADCs, one of the key things is that they need a reference. When a DAC is outputting some digital value, it does so by comparing it to its low and high references to know exactly what it should be putting out. Now, when you have a single wire DAC and not a differential DAC, ground is your low reference, right? So ground, our analog ground is gonna be the low reference for the DAC. And this reference in represents the ceiling for the DAC. And we want this voltage to be very accurate. So we're using a reference voltage IC that has high accuracy. And we'll see that on the next schematic. And it outputs 4.096 volts very accurately. So that's the range of this DAC is from ground to 4.096. And of course, if you wanted your DAC outputs to be higher voltage, you would probably have to add some type of amplifier on the output of those. Now we could, for this reference in, use our five volt power supply. The data sheet even says it. And if if you're familiar with Arduino, because I talk about Arduino a lot in our in these tutorials, Arduino typically just uses the power supply as your reference for your ADC in the microcontroller or your DAC in the case of you know things like the Arduino Zero. But that's not a good practice, especially if you want to get maximum accuracy, right? Because let's say your five volt linear regulator has one percent air. Well, five volt, one percent air, that's 50 millivolts. If you have 50 millivolts of air in your reference, that means all your DAC outputs are going to be 50 millivolts off, which just totally blows away all the, you know, the accuracy specs that you're paying for. And another thing about using the power supply, let's say you do have a very accurate power supply. Well, power supplies voltages, uh, and when I say power supply, I'm referring to linear regulators or DC to DC converters or power supplies. Whenever the load changes, a lot of times a power supply's voltage level will shift slightly. So you, you can see in a case where you have a circuit where there's a lot going on, at one minute, your reference is at 5.01 volts. And the next minute, because the load change, it's at 4.99 volts, right? So you have this moving target for your reference. So that's why you want to be key to use a dedicated reference that's ha that has high accuracy, or at least accuracy that matches the accuracy specs of the DAC. Now, this chip also has a built-in reference. I think it's, I forget the exact value, but I think it's about 2.5 volts built in. So you could use that. I'm not going to use it. I'm going to use an even more higher accuracy reference that has a higher voltage level. And this ref O is the reference value out. If you're using an external reference, this chip won't, out, won't output the reference through pin 16. But if you're using the internal reference, it will output the reference value internally here at pin 16. The other thing that's key with power supplies is the bypass caps. And so for the analog supply, we have two bypass caps. Uh, C9 and C10, and it's important to have those close to the pin. And I'll talk more about bypass capacitors, their values, and why they should be close to the pins on the next slide. But where did I get these values for the bypass caps? The data sheet told me, right? So always read the data sheet. And then we have a bypass cap for a reference in, and then for the digital supply, we have a bypass cap. We're using analog ground for all the ground connections because this chip does not have separate grounds for digital and analog. I am using uh, the standard ground for the, uh, the bypass cap here. But the idea is this chip doesn't have a digital ground, so it just said tie everything to analog ground. So that's what I did. And then let's talk about some of the other pins because we, we talked about the DAC output channels. We talked about the digital control channels. We talked about the power channels. We also have some other pins, right? So we have this ready not pin. So when you're communicating with this chip, changing settings and you're done, this ready pin goes low. And the reason, the main reason they have this is, first of all, you can communicate the things that the chip's ready mainly for daisy chaining chips together. So let's say you want to daisy chain two, three, four of these chips together. That means you have to use a chip select pin for each one of the chips if they have different settings. Well, this ready pin sort of makes it so you don't have to do that. You can control three or four of these chips with one chip select and tying the ready pin to the other or daisy chaining the ready pin from one chip to the next for setting up your spy communication. So you talk to one first, the ready pin goes low, you talk to the next one, so on and so forth. So that's what the ready pin is there for. We also have the LDAC pin. The LDAC pin is basically there so you could signal using an active low for all the outputs to update their value, their output value at the same time. 
So let's say over SPY, you communicate different values to the channel. Before you update those channels with those new values, if you want to do it simultaneously, you can through SPY, or you can turn them on one by one through SPY, or you can use this pin to do it simultaneously through hardware. And then the last pin we have on here is the M slash Z pin. So this is more of like a, how do you want the outputs to be when you first power up the chip? So if you tie this to ground, the outputs will always be low when you power up the chip. And if you tie it to uh, VCC, it'll be so the all the outputs are at mid-level. And that's the way I have it configured. For my application, it really doesn't matter. But you, of course, you could change it if you'd like. Now, I will mention that this is a string DAC. So I'm not going to go into DAC architectures in this video, but uh, this is a string DAC, which uses a lot of resistors for setting the output value. And then DACs come with a lot of different specs that can be hard to understand. I'm not going to go into that video. I have that in an older video I did, a video series where the videos, I think, are both like a half an hour long. So I'll include a link to those, but I'm not going to get into those in this video. All right, so that's how we implement the MAX 5134. Let's look at the rest of the circuit. Okay, here are my power circuits. So I have my input power, I have my five volt linear regulator that's low noise, and then I have my voltage reference. So let's start with where the power is coming into the design. So I set this up and this is how the linear regulator works is it can take an input of about 5.5 volts to 12 volts. So that's the input voltage range. So that's coming in here where I have labeled power in. And then the output is here where you see 12 volts. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be 12 volts. 12 volts is the max, but I'm just using a uh, model icon that says 12 volts. And then in between here, we have a bunch of filter caps or bypass caps, and we have a ferrite bead. So we're using various cap values. We have 22 microfarads, we have one microfarad, we have 100 na nanofarads, and then after the ferrite bead, we have 10 nanofarads. And these caps are here to bypass noise from our power supply, which will most likely be a switching power supply, to ground, right? And you might say, well, why not just use one really high value capacitor? Why not just use 147 microfarad or 122 microfarad capacitor? The reason you want to have different values, because capacitance, you know, from circuit theory adds in parallel. But the reason you want to use different values is capacitors have parasitics, right? They're not perfect. There's ESR, which is equivalent series resistance in the capacitor. There's inductance, parasitic inductance in the capacitors. So one of the reasons it's good to use a mix, and often you separate this mix of capacitors by different magnitudes, is because the parasitics will interact with the different frequencies in different ways. So it helps you provide a low impedance path for different noise frequencies to ground. And then a ferrite bead is like an attenuator that provides high impedance at high frequency. So at DC, it acts like a short. And then what happens is that resistance goes up the higher the frequency that's trying to pass through it. So once again, it's there to block high frequency resistance. Now, it doesn't do too well on low frequency. So, you know, whether it's like 100 hertz or 1K or even 10K, there's going to be very little resistance for those values. It's mainly more for the higher frequency components to filter those out. And then a good practice is to put a capacitor on either side of your ferrite bead and you kind of create this low pass filter network. So that's why I have the last one, the 10 nanofarads after the ferrite bead. Okay, next let's talk about our linear regulator. So this is a high accuracy linear regulator and it has a high PSRR value. And I'll talk about that in a, in a minute, but that's important when you're worried about noise. And it's a, it's a spec I think a lot of people don't pay attention to in linear regulators, but it's a, a key spec for sensitive circuits. So we have our 12 volts or could be 12 volts or down to 5.5 volts, which is the, you know, the same, it's the output of this connecting to here. We have two bypass caps. Remember, you always want to have your bypass caps close to the pin of the IC. So why is that? Why do we have to have the bypass caps close to the IC? Why not just have them anywhere in the signal path? The reason you want to do that is because you're trying to eliminate parasitics in the PCB trace, whether that's resistance or inductance, between your capacitor and the IC. The IC a lot of times uses... One way you can think of bypass caps, besides think of them as filters, is they serve as energy rev reservoirs. So when the IC needs to pull some quick current, it can pull some of that energy from the caps without affecting the voltage level. 
And if you have parasitic resistance or inductance between there, it can affect the IC's ability to quickly pull energy from the caps. So that's why you want to have bypass caps close to your ICs. And we'll see that when we do the PCB layout. All right, we have an output here with a 2.2 microfarad cap. And once again, the data sheet for this linear regulator recommended that along with this other bypass cap right here. And then we have our two lines. We have our digital 5 volt supply and our analog one. And so what we have here is just a ferrite bead and another capacitor. And the ferrite bead's job is to block digital noise because we have that spy communication running at 30 megahertz. And when you have a digital signal where it's making quick transitions from low to high, some of that can affect the power supply and add noise to the power supply line. So the ferrite bead is meant to block that so we have a nice, clean analog supply. And the output where the analog supply is is analog ground, but the other ground is just the standard ground. That's what we're using here. And one last thing I'll mention about bypass caps. We talked about why you want to use different values. We talked about having them close to the chip. You also, when you're using ceramic caps, you want to make sure there's a lot of dielectric choices you can do for cer ceramic caps. And different ones have different advantages and different applications. For bypass caps, you typically want to use dielectrics that have low ESR, like X5R and X7R. We choose those dielectrics for bypass caps in this application to ensure low ESR. And then finally, we have our voltage reference. Like I said, it's 4.096 volts, and that's going to serve as the reference for the DAC, right? So we want this to be highly accurate. I chose a very accurate reference. In fact, it may even be overkill for this, for this DAC. But you can see we have our bypass cap here, and this reference is on analog ground. Then we have our output of the reference. I have a jumper here just because uh, for this circuit, I'll use a different reference if you want and shut this reference off. Uh, so this is the output of the reference, and then we just have this jumper here. Here's a bypass cap. Now, this reference has something you don't see on too many ICs or voltage sources or references. It has a sense line. The idea with the sense line is it probably has some type of feedback loop for an amplifier inside this voltage reference. And what's happening here is to ensure that the voltage is accurate at the load, you can run this feedback that in a lot of ICs, this just happens inside the IC right at the output, but you can actually move this close to the load. That way the voltage reference is getting feedback right at the load instead of at its output, which can further make the output more accurate. So that is the voltage reference. Now I want to come back here. I forgot to mention, I forgot to jump in and explain more about the PSRR. So let me look at, this is a linear regular, five volt linear regular, low noise, high accuracy from microchip. So let's look at the data sheet real quick on this linear regulator. Okay, so we're at the data sheet for this linear regulator and I jumped right to some of the specs and I wanted to point out PSRR. PSRR stands for power supply rejection ratio. And it's basically a spec that talks about the linear regulator's ability to reject noise. A lot of LDOs will have good PSRR specs because they're powering microcontrollers or ADCs that need low noise. So that's, you know, a linear regulator's main job is to regulate its output voltage to some constant value or its current. But this can be a good secondary spec to pay attention to is what's its ability to reject the noise on its input so it doesn't get to the output. So notice PSRR, they give it in dB, 75 dB, and notice the frequency. So they're saying at this frequency, it, it can attenuate signals 75 dB, which is a lot. It picked 120 hertz. Well, if you think about it, what is 120 hertz? Well, it's double 60 hertz. Well, where do you see double 60 hertz? Well, a power supply, if it has a full bridge rectifier, which all modern power suppliers mainly do, basically takes that 60 hertz signal sine wave and turns it into just these humps that are at a frequency of 100 hertz, 120 hertz. So that's why they're specifically calling out this frequency value. They're basically saying this is really good at attenuating power supply ripple. Now, if I jump to these curves, here they're showing a bigger picture of the PSRR spec over various frequency ranges. So here they're showing it that it attenuates really high at low frequencies and then starts to uh, not attenuate so well and then attenuates more. This is some type of resident peak here. But also notice on these curves, they're talking about your bypass cap, right? So they say that your bypass cap is what affects it. But notice they're, they're saying the output current. 
So what I think is funny is they're showing it at 100 microamps, which most people aren't using their linear regulator at that low current. So what's more realistic is if you go down here and you have 100 milliamps and you can see the spec is not as good, right? So higher current leads to uh, less attenuation of noise, which is not surprising. So at, at this more realistic current value, uh, you can see you're you're just getting above 60 at the low frequencies and then it drops off at the higher frequencies. Now, one thing you want to pay attention to when you're looking at your noise is noise at frequencies that are related to the signals you're producing with the DAC, or in the case of ADCs, the signals that you're measuring with the ADC. So I'm using this DAC at low frequencies, so I want to make sure I have good attenuation at low frequencies. So it's important to know what frequencies of noise do you really care about, or that will have the most uh, negative effect on your design. Okay, for part one of this video, designing a low noise four channel DAC circuit with the MAX 5134, we went over how to implement the DAC, we went over how to implement the surrounding circuitry, the power circuitry to make sure it's low noise and it's not gonna degrade the accuracy of the DAC. If you have any questions from part one, please use the comment section. And if you have anything to add, because I know there's a lot of other techniques and specs you need to care about for noise. So if there's anything important you think I missed, please use the comments section to add that. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you back here for part two.